Good evening. Um, so uh, I'm the CTO of Kickstarter. I was one of the original engineers who worked on Docker. Um, it's one of the original engineers that worked on Puppet. I'm sorry about that for those of you who had to worked on Puppet. Um, uh, I've written seven technology books um, and I've been an engineer for about 25 years. I also have a funny accent. I'm originally from Australia. Yeah, it's a sort of like a Long Island, but bigger. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, if, I don't, if I say something you don't understand, uh, just assume it's a swear word. Um, <laughs> It's pretty common. Uh, this is obligatory. Our VP of HR doesn't let me leave without doing this. Uh, we're hiring a Kickstarter as a public benefit corp, so a mission-driven organization, which makes it a little bit different from a lot of other companies. We're not uh, so much driven by revenue. We're not a traditional startup. Uh, you know, we uh, give our engineers liquidity by, by uh, giving them stock that's worth money. Um, this is a concept some of you may not be familiar with, but it's, uh, it's where your options are, 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 you can sell them to people. Um, uh, we do that because we're not gonna go public and we're not gonna uh, sell to anybody. Um, we're interested in, in building things that are awesome and creative and allowing a platform for people to do that as part of their lives. So uh, whether it's uh, building a, a panel um, or whether someone's putting on a dance production in, in Minnesota uh, or someone putting an art show in Cuba, you know, we provide a, a platform for people to do things like that, and our focus is really on people building those creative products. Uh, I'm also writing a book called The Art of Monitoring. This is my sole, like, personal pitch. Uh, I'm really sick of crappy monitoring environments, and I'm trying to sort of talk about better ways of doing things. Have a look at the site. talks about what I'm, I'm going to do and all that sort of stuff. Um, so who here, is a, who here is an engineer? Everyone's an engineer? Anyone work in recruiting? Just, just kidding, just kidding. Um, uh, who's a full-stack engineer? Is that a thing? Okay, all right. Uh, Back-end engineers? Uh, Front-end engineers? Anyone in data? Okay, all right. I'm always, I'm always interested to see what the mix of how people describe. I think there were enough hands up that, that some people are confused about what they do, or they're, or they're the person who does everything, including the cabling. Um, so what's this all about? I'm gonna talk about monoliths, uh, and I'm gonna talk most principally about uh, why we have decided to move away from the monolith we have. Um, and a bit about um, you know, that process and what that process is, has, has taught us about, about technology. So uh, once upon a time, um, Kickstarter is about seven years old this year. Uh, the team was very small for a very long time. Uh, my principal engineer was the very first engineer who worked at the company. Uh, and uh, so effectively the founding engineer of the company. He was the fourth employee after the three founders. Um, and uh, he was a, a Rails engineer, um, and uh, he was based in, um, in Washington, um, and uh, the state, not the, the city. Why you people do that, I have no idea, but um, uh, uh, I think it, he, was, uh, he was from um, one of those places, Spokane or something like that, I don't know. Um, it, it's, it's, it's a funny name, uh, that state over the other side. Um, and he was a, a Ruby and Rails engineer, and he was like, I'm gonna build this, this platform that they're gonna, they're gonna fund things on in, in Rails because it's a, you know, at that stage, it was pretty much a, an up-and-coming framework. There wasn't a huge body of, uh, of, of work around Rails, um, and uh, there certainly wasn't as, as sort of uh, mature as it is now. So fast forward uh, seven years later, uh, we have a very large monolithic Rails application, um, and that application um, has proven very successful for us. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm one of those people that is a firm believer in uh, the right tool for the right time and the right technology. Uh, who here um, actually works on, has a monolithic app? Who has a thing they would describe as a monolithic app? Ooh, not very many hands, okay. Who, who is a, works in a sort of service-oriented architecture sort of environment, like a services architecture? Okay, cool, that's good, that's interesting. Usually I get a, 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 a probably about an 80-20, um, so it looks like the world is moving, which is great. Um, so, for our, for our purposes, um, everything got it's got it start it's got us started, um, and you know as a sort of scale thing goes, uh, we have 10 million users, 100,000 successful projects, and people have raised two billion dollars on the platform. Um, so as that thing goes, that, that's a pretty good effort for a consumer web company. Um, there are definitely people that have grown faster than us. There are definitely people that have higher um, uh, concurrency rates. Definitely people have higher transaction rates. But we've been pretty successful with with our with our monolithic Rails app. Um, and some of the reason for that is we're pretty thoughtful about how it was built. So we thought, um, we don't, definitely didn't go down the path of premature, premature optimization, but we definitely thought about a few things where we were like, huh, you know, maybe what happens if, if we end up with 100,000 projects, maybe this should be, a, you know, this schema should look like this, and this particular thing should be structured like this. And we're pretty good about going back and refactoring things. 
Uh, but the bar keeps getting higher. And uh, what I, we're most concerned about at the moment is that you know, we can probably scale out the, the Rails app another 18 months, two years. I'm pretty comfortable that, that we can throw more servers at it. We can, we can you know, every now and again, we stumble across an unfortunate code path that, you know, uh, I think last year we had an outage when um, a particular project came up and they, they decided that uh, midway through their campaign, they would change their rewards. Uh, and uh, 10,000 people simultaneously tried to change their rewards. Not a code path that was exercised very often, needless to say, did not end well. Um, and that project actually is launching another project this year and the CEO just emailed me going, mate, please make that not happen again. Um, so that's the sort of stuff I, I, I wanna care about. And um, the interesting thing about that is that it's not so much scale. Um, scale is actually, uh, these days, it's relatively easy to scale out an application. Um, and this is gonna sound a little bit, um, it's gonna sound a little bit entitled perhaps, or arrogant, but it's actually not that hard to throw hardware at a problem. And hardware is relatively cheap. Um, if you're in, hosted in Amazon, uh, if you look at, at, at the, sort of, the sort of volume of stuff you can throw at things, and the fact that they keep releasing instances and types and, and things that provide lots more memory and, and CPU, you can actually scale your way out of a whole bunch of problems. Now, at various points in time, you will hit things that are like, okay, this is a limitation of the technology. Um, but for all intents and purposes, unless you are sort of having a Pinterest or an Instagram moment, uh, for the vast majority of us, you know, the way our growth works, you're probably gonna be okay. And I can probably hand count the number of engineers who have had that sort of problem and had to deal with it. You know, probably, you know both hands, uh, you know, there's not, there's not a huge number of those out there. Most people have fits and starts growths and have different sort of, they have time to breathe. What I'm more concerned about is resilience. So the biggest problem I have with having a monolith is that when something breaks in one part of the monolith, it often breaks another part of the monolith. So we recently had uh, a series of comment spam problems. Now, uh, the spam, sub the comments the subsystem is very highly optimized. You can shoot lots of comments and things awesomely fine. Uh, but if it, you know, it does have a point at which it breaks. And so when our, our, our system reaches that point, um, database CPU is saturated and the rest of the system starts to slow down. So I look at that as, as sort of like a, a, a problem that I, I'm gonna have to deal with. I can scale my way out of that problem. I can probably throw more, more, um, you know, more RDS instances at it or more memory at it. Um, it's not ideal, it's gonna cost me some money. Um, but in the process of determining which of those subsystems is gonna go down next, which is pretty hard to test for, it's often hard to actually do determine complex interactions. Anyone who works on distributed systems can tell you if you poke one thing, you know, there's a good chance that, that it's gonna take you a while to realize that it's gonna have a, sp a, sp a spinning effect over here. So what I really care about is breaking the monolith up in such a way that I can actually scale out those subsystems and not have them impact other things. So for example, I'm okay if I lose the comment subsystem, it's not mission critical to me. But if I lose the payment system, no one can back a project. So I wanna be able to say, if an, an issue happens, a fault happens in my comment system, I'm not gonna be concerned about the fact that it's gonna impact the payment system. So in order to think about this, um, uh, and you know, uh, to give you some sort of backstory here, uh, until 18 months ago, Kickstarter had 10 engineers. So the whole platform was built with 10 engineers. Uh, that's not ideal um, when, you are, when you want to actually think about large scale changes to the environment. Because we are a very feature focused organization, it's very hard for us to think about um, uh, like you know, diving into technical debt or doing big architectural things because we're really focused on delivering stuff around the platform. So we scaled out the team a bit um, and as part of that process, um, we started to think about how we're actually gonna like, address the fact that everyone on the team is very much used to this Ruby on Rails world, very much used to building in this monolithic world. How do we actually find a, a, a common ground or a middle ground to have this conversation? So what we did was we brought a whole bunch of people into the room and had a, 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 you know, a fairly open dialogue. And at this stage, we probably had about 30 engineers. And uh, we sat down and we had a, a, a round table. And what we did was we, everyone sat in a, we have a theater space, everyone sat in a theater space. We had four chairs at the front of the theater space. Uh, and you could basically uh, opt in to sit in a chair. And a chair always had to be empty. And essentially, we rotated people through. You know, if you had a comment, you'd jump into a chair and make the comment. Uh, you left the conversation when you felt you'd given your point or that, you know, and it allowed people to sort of share a few, few viewpoints. So we essentially went to, we sat down and said, what are the things we care about in our monolith? What are the parts of the monolith that are problematic for us? And what are the things that we need to do? You know, what are some potential architectures we can adopt? 
Uh, some people had no experience with building services or distributed systems. Other people had deep experience. Other people had deep experience with certain particular technologies and platforms, uh, with certain data stores. And we had to, so because we were thinking about, you know, like, okay, maybe in our, our new services oriented world, or if that's where we end up, then maybe a single monolithic database is not a good choice. Or maybe one of the data stores we've chosen, for example, Redis or a caching layer like Memcache, is no longer the ideal solution. So let's start to throw all of those things out there. And we spent a couple of days sort of workshopping a bunch of ideas and eventually came up with a, a broad architecture. And the architecture was loosely like, was loosely sort of around the fact that, okay, um, we were pretty comfortable that the monolith was not going to work for us and that we're going to build services. And we had a pretty good idea what a service looked like. Um, and we had some ideas about uh, you know, the, the sort of various components of that. And mo most of those were sort of a meta level. So we're thinking about things like, you know, we need to have monitoring, we need to have metrics, we need to care about authentication, we need to care about, uh, you know, logging, things like that, things that were sort of broad conditions. And then we said to ourselves, okay, what's the next layer down? And we're basically gonna choose to do a paper bake-off. And what we did was we basically drew, took out a bunch of frameworks and we looked at, uh, we looked at Clojure, we looked at Java, uh, we looked at Ruby, as, as, uh, uh, because naturally we have a huge in, in a huge code base of Ruby, and when it's ne technically never going to go away, I suspect. Um, and we looked at Go. Um, we looked at something else too. Uh, oh, um, JRuby. And we basically sat down and said, let's look at all of the aspects of these languages and, fr and the frameworks associated with them and choose one that works best for us. And we choose to do this in a paper-based way initially because there's a bunch of things you should care about that have nothing to do with a language. So I'm a huge fan of Clojure. I, I love Clojure to death. You could, you could, uh, you know, you could probably not even pay me to write Clojure some days. Um, uh, I don't feel the same way about Ruby, um, but I've been written Ruby for nearly 10 years. So like, you know, swings around about. But there are things about the Clojure community, for example, it's not huge. Like I, I can. Pretty much, I pretty much know everybody who works in some way on Clojure. Um, or, and I've met a fair chunk of them. Um, in the case of the Ruby community, that's not even vaguely true. Like, I, I've been to a Rails conference and I've looked around and gone, I know like 10 people here. Um, or, you, you know, I, I, I rarely stumble across a startup that doesn't have a Rails app somewhere. So there's definitely pros and cons. The JRuby community is the same way. Like, literally, I think there are 14 people in the JRuby community. It's an awesome platform, but, but, but it's not a platform that's going to have a, like a, a huge standard lib ever. Um, some, people, some of you may know that JRuby's SSL was broken for like 12 months before anyone noticed. Uh, well, I think everyone's SSL is broken, but it was actually fundamentally didn't work. Um, it, oh, actually, well, how should I phrase this? It, it didn't work more than all of the other things don't work. Um, so there are things like that that are real challenges that, that you, you care about that are things other than the language. Like you care about the community, you care about standard lib, you care about what's out there in the way of prior art. And you care about the fact that other people share your concerns, because obviously if I'm gonna hire people, if I decide I'm gonna write in Clojure or in Go, I have to drag all the people who don't want to work on really cool infrastructure things or build systems libraries, and I have to hire those people. So I have to be able to persuade them as to why we're a great place for you to write Go at, or you write Clojure at, or you write Ruby at. And it's definitely the pool of Ruby developers is significantly larger than the pool of, of Clojure developers. So this provided us with a way to actually look down and without writing a line of code, basically look out those communities, those languages, those frameworks, and basically shortlist some things we wanted to look at. So we came up with a shortlist and we chose to uh, because of our sort of, I guess, our, our home team advantage, we, we, choose, we chose to look at Ruby. Um, not without Rails, generally, we looked at Ruby in, in terms of frameworks and had things we could add to on top of, on top of Ruby. Uh, we looked at Java because we're, we have a, a number of people in the organization that write Java too. So we have an Android team. Um, we have a, a bunch of native folks that spend, live in the Java world. And some of us come from that sort of, some of us might even remember J2EE. You all look way, way, way too, too young to remember J2EE. But um, some of us might have written 20 million lines of stupid financial services code in Java. So, uh, and we, we, um, uh, we also looked at, um, we also looked at Clojure. And my pet, uh, my pet desire was for us to choose Clojure. Uh, unfortunately, the CTO choosing the framework of things over the wishes of every single other engineer in the organization. I like being dictatorial every now and again, but mostly about what beer we choose rather than uh, things like, uh, like what language we choose. So we essentially took that short list and we did a real world bake off. So we basically built a service in each of those languages and we built as much of the supporting framework as we could. So we looked at things like authentication and monitoring uh, and logging and uh, uh, all of the sort of aspects of the thing, of the service that would allow people to actually build, build on top of that. Um, and we chose to build our comment, in this case, we chose our comment subsystem as the example. 
And we cared about a few different things. The first thing we cared about was how easy is this going to be for someone else to learn? Uh, we have a, uh, a team full of people and I don't, I, the key thing for me is developer happiness. So I want to have the team go, I want to write stuff in this new services framework. I want to adopt this new services framework and I don't want to have people go, eh, I could just sneak back to the monolith and I could just go over here and, and I can hide in this corner over here and I can solve this problem by reverting to type. Um, barring the fact that Ruby is not a type language. Um, but very poor joke, I apologize. Um, it's sort of a dad joke, I'm sadly not a dad either. But uh, we looked at that sort of, you know, how will people onboard this? How will, can we teach people how to use it? And, and skin, given that two of those languages were ones that, that the team was not, was not, were not sort of native to everyone in the team, uh, meant that those, that's a really big concern because you all of a sudden, you know, you have to, you know, people, most people, developers are happy to learn a new language, but it's very intimidating when it feels imposed, imposed upon them and they feel a lot of pressure. So you want to find something that's going to onboard simply and easily. Then we cared about performance. Um, in the case of anything running on top of the JVM, it's going to kick um, the Ruby VM's ass every single time. Like there's, there's categorically challenge you to find me a Ruby VM that's going to run faster than the JVM. I just, it's just not possible. Um, uh, that presents that presents some some interesting sort of challenges and and some way and sort of having to pad in and saying how do we scale if if we chose the Ruby VM you know as a services based model would it scale and how, where would it stop and where would the intersection between say a JVM and the Ruby VM sort of exist so that means that testing becomes a lot more complicated performance testing which is already a reasonably complex entity became very hard for us um, and then we looked at at, at sort of the you know, essentially the supporting material. Essentially, what, how easy was it for us to choose a framework, to choose drop-ins, to have things that, you know, that are the convenience methods of the world. So one thing, a great thing about the Rails community is that there basically is a gem or a plugin or a something, whether it be a Stack Overflow article or an actual, you know, a Ruby gem that basically solves your problem because someone else is bound to have stumbled across this. Like if you do credit card validation, I think there are like 14 gems that don't do LUN 10 uh, uh, verification. Literally, there is someone out there who has four something and built something and I'm guilty of this too like I'm pretty sure there's a bunch of things that I definitely should have committed back committed back to uh, upstream instead of forking it but the Ruby community has a huge corpus of stuff out there so when we looked at things like um, closure and Java we we're like what are the things out there that will provide us with these capabilities um, and so in the end after building doing all of this uh, we basically um, sat down and took the bake-off results and presented it to the team. So the team, the, there was a small group of engineers who built these services, uh, two engineers who built all three services in each language, presented the pros and cons to the whole team and, and basically said, here's where we came to, presented the results of all the performance testing. Uh, ultimately, we decided to go um, uh, with Java. Um, which was a surprising decision for some people on the team, but one that probably doesn't surprise me very much, and I'll explain why. Um, and uh, yeah, what old is new again? You know, uh, I was a bit shocked with when 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 the Java was sort of like in the in the in the the high level of the running. But new Java ain't old Java. Uh, if you're if you're writing new Java, it's a very different thing. Um, uh, my my memories of Java are like you know sort of six or something, and and things that things are a lot different in the world. Um, I actually find writing modern Java very, very elegant, um, and I find it very simple um, in a way that I never thought I would say about Java. Um, and we also adopted a framework called DropWizard, which provides a bunch of sort of uh, essentially, you could think about it like a web framework um, or, a, or, a, or more, probably more advanced in a sense of a, a proper actual supporting framework for building services and building applications in Java. So it provides integration with things like, Let's say you want metrics, it, it provides integration with Coda Hale's metrics library and stuff like that. So it's essentially you know, provides you with a, a on-ramp to building a really simple Java service. Um, and even I even felt like I, every now and again I look at a, you know, I'm like, uh, if you've ever written any, hey, who has written Java? If you have hands up, you know, the, the feeling where you're like, oh my God, this is, this is flowing on and on and on and I've just written 400 lines of something that, that I could have, like, is effectively boilerplate. Like modern Java doesn't give you that that same feel. It's very you know I find I find actually living in Eclipse or or an, or an IDE now is not a painful experience as it used to be. Um, so that was pretty exciting for us uh, and and a reasonably big decision because for for the team you know, that's a very it's a very new thing. Despite I think that probably a third of the team has written Java, so it's something that we're we're pretty excited about um, about picking up. Um, but the real pragmatic win for us was actually the process. So. When we sat down and thought about this, we were like, okay, um, we've actually gone through a, a process that involved, I believe, uh, if I think about it, zero arguments, 
Uh, zero pull requests that it had, you know, 90 comments on them where people were, were bitter and twisted. Uh, I had to separate zero engineers. Um, I, I had to buy a few drinks every now and again, but um, generally speaking, we did not have a single like raised voice in this whole process. And I was like, huh? We, you know, normally I have two engineers in a room and 15 opinions. And here we actually managed to find a way to actually get people to decide on technology without having uh, you know, a, a Vim versus Emacs discussion. Um, <laughs> Oh, why, why people still have that discussion? I don't know. There must be some other examples I could use, but um, uh, you know, a, a Go versus Rust or something. I don't know. Um, but so what we we basically took was we extracted out of this. We extracted the process. So we said that process we adopted. Maybe it was a little bit long-winded, but we, let's think we can shorten it. And what we chose to do was build a technology selection framework. And essentially, what it is is it's experiment-driven. So. Uh, you basically say, uh, I'm an engineer, I want to propose an idea. I think we should use Neo4j. Uh, and uh, it's a really useful data store, and we, here's the example I want to, I want to test it on. Uh, I want to have uh, me and these three other engineers are going to spend four weeks working on this, and we're going to build a prototype of something, a service, a capability, a feature. I'm going to build it around this new technology. Uh, we're then going to, we're going to have a series of questions we ask, which is things like, you know, uh, sort of stuff I've talked about, you know, how, how easy is this to learn? How valuable is this? Is, a pat is this a pattern we will adopt in more than one place? Essentially things that, that highlight whether this is a, tr a useful choice for us. Um, and then uh, adopt that, that process. And if it doesn't succeed or you can't persuade, certainly if you can't persuade three other engineers that, that this is a good idea, you're, you're probably not going to get very far. But, you know, if you get to the end of the experiment and it's successful and you answer all of those questions, then this is a technology we would look at adopting. Um, and for us, we, we, you know, we're aware of being very thoughtful about the technologies we adopt. We're a very traditional stack. Um, this provides us a way to expand that stack while still being thoughtful and still being uh, consistent and, and true to the values of, ha of how we want to build software. Too often I see blog-driven software, um, or I come across companies who have four JavaScript frameworks. Um, somebody liked Angular, somebody else liked Backbone. There's a person over there who wrote this thing in Ember. Um, and then there's this other person over there who refuses to let go of their jQuery spaghetti. Like th that, there, there are, you know, if, if you are literally looking at someone's, uh, someone's page and they've managed to load Backbone, Ember, and Angular all at the same time, this is not actually something that, that uh, this is not actually something that's unusual in some circumstances. And it's a pain in the ass. And with a small engineering team, you cannot maintain that many technology choices. You certainly can't learn them all, and you certainly can't make objective decisions about them. And so you end up with these technology silos. In this way, this process allows us to actually uh, choose, like carefully to expand our technology stack and choose to say, okay, well, if we're gonna add this data store, why don't we deprecate this other one? And that becomes a requirement on the system. It's like, you can choose to use this data store, but you need to actually consider the implications of the other data stores, how we actually think about technical debt. So for us, the, the, I'm pretty excited about the fact that we're gonna start building some services. I'm, pretty excited, I'm even excited it's gonna be in Java. Um, but I'm more excited about the fact that we now have a way to actually go forward and think about some of this stuff. Um, and we're also, I'm, gonna, I'm hopefully going to talk later in the year with, um, at a couple of conferences about the next thing we're going to do, which is looking at RFCs for, for more sort of architecture and patterns and how we actually, you know, how, we, how this process is going to function and what sort of questions we ask and how we weight those questions. Because I think those are really interesting, interesting things to consider. So this is the way, uh, this is sort of the becomes our future. Um, and uh, we've, uh, I think we're now up to sort of 35, 36 engineers, um, some data folks, and I also manage trust and safety. Uh, and this is a process we hope will scale with that and allow us to actually scale the platform in a sort of successful, but thoughtful and sort of systematic kind of way. Thank you. Um, so one question for me to put you on the spot. So sure. if you're building your own company, just you, what stack would you choose? Web-based application. <laughs> That's just mean. Um, <laughs> so uh, I would probably, given that, given that, um, okay, let, let's assume that I think I'm going to be successful and I might have to hire <laughs> another engineer at some point. I'd probably choose something like Rails, um, just because it's really simple and, and easy to prototype. Um, I might not build all the pieces. Else, I think I'd probably build some back-end pieces in uh, as a services model. But um, if I was thinking about the front end and a fair chunk of the pieces, you get an OM for free. You know, active records are not too hideous. You know, like th th there's stuff in there that, that, that's kind of useful. 
and kind of I don't want to care about if I'm focusing on a, on MVP. Um, and front-end framework? Probably Ember, just based on my experience. Um, uh, though the people that, as, my, as one of my front-end engineers said to me today, we talk about James as JavaScript and then we weep. And uh, so uh, uh, I'm not generally allowed to write JavaScript. I'm, I'm a back-end engineer and an infrastructure person. I have been for a long time. Uh, it's probably best, and, and before Bootstrap came along, God help you with the websites, but um, I, it's probably best that I don't write JavaScript. So okay. thank you. That was on the record. Uh, yeah, no, I'm sure it was. Um, <laughs> questions, <laughs> questions, gentlemen. Um, guessing that you didn't run a Rails monolith to a Java monolith. I'm guessing a containers guru, you probably had it also started to your way to establish the microservice. Repeat the question. My, my question is, was it necessary to make a decision on just one technology stack, or could you have different technology stacks that specialize in different so the question is, could, could we have more than one technology stack that specializes in different, different pieces? Um, 35 engineers, having lots of technology stacks means that, that maintainability becomes really tricky. Um, so I'm, I'm nervous about maintainability across two, effectively, you know, we have, we have uh, Swift, uh, we have Android Java, we'll have Java and Ruby, and effectively we have JavaScript, uh, and if I can in the data team, I've got R, and, and so we have like a, a fairly diverse technology stack already. Um, maintainability across that is, is tricky. Um, like if, uh, you know, again, the, the, the challenge of having multiple JavaScript frameworks comes up here, like, you know, if you have to context shift between Angular and, and Backbone, mm, that seems like a waste of time. Um, so we wanted to be sort of reasonably selective about choosing that. Um, <laughs> maybe if we were a division of a large company, you know, I, I would feel differently. I've, I've, I've certainly worked in banks where like things, there were 20, 20 core languages and every application was, was a, a silo. Uh, there's certainly the Amazon model where everything is an API black box, right? Who cares what you build the stack in because all you're communicating is schemas and APIs. Uh, we don't have that sort of organization or that sort of scale. And wow, I questions. dazzled everyone with my brilliance. <laughs> Any interest in open sourcing your framework? Uh, probably, yeah. Um, we're, uh, we're fairly keen. We've open sourced a bunch of stuff. We, we're fairly keen on open sourcing things. Uh, I come I from, a, yeah. Selection. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm, I, I should publish a blog post about it. Um, it it's, uh, well, I should actually get the team that, that, that spent most of the time on it to publish a blog post on it. Realistically, my chance of writing a blog post are about zero, but um, uh, yeah, I think that's worth talking about. Right back. So you mentioned that you did the bake off, the technology bake off, right? Uh, what did you measure for those and how did you compare it? Yeah, the technology bake off, we were, we were, um, we were looking at um, some fairly uh, sort of qualitative things, which was sort of like um, developer experience writing the code. Like, was this easy? Was this simple? Could you just pull in standard things to do this? Like, were the, library, the right libraries there? Were the basics there? Um, how easy was it to build tests? How easy was testing? How easy was deployment? Um, like, so we basically built a, sort of effectively a, a, a scale replica of what that service would look like in production and then measured up like how would that work? And then on a quantitative point of view, um, you know, it was like request per second and like, you know, CPU and memory and, and how it actually performed, how the VMs actually weighted off against it. And I, I wasn't shocked to discover the JVM, if you tune it right, is lightning fucking fast, right? Sorry, that's a bad word. Very, very fast. <laughs> okay, so any children watching? So you were mentioning that for the uh, the experiments, you had two people working on it for about a month. Uh, what would be your recommendation for a small startup with a smaller engineering team? Uh, you know, if you have ten or thirty engineers, you can get you can get away with two people not working, but. Don't make bad technology choices. No, I'm, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> the question is how you would approach doing this if you're a very small team. Um, I think you have to scale experiments down. So I think you have to choose. Um, uh, and I, I think, you know, uh, yeah, you have to scale experiments down. And I think you have to be very pragmatic with your time. Like, um, uh, we had an opportunity to spend a month. I, I would say, you know, maybe your time box it to two days. Uh, and you go, um, your, your, your future proofing is, is out at 12 months and not at two years or three years. Um, 
I can't guarantee that's not going to go wrong at some point. Lots of people implemented Mongo. Um, but, <laughs> oh, did I say that out loud? <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, it's certainly going to give you some, some you know, certainly it gives you a better choice than going, okay, I, I just read a blog post about this, we should write in this language and this framework. Um, uh, also, I think, you know, thinking about more than just the, the code, thinking about actually, like, is there a community around this? Will, it, will I be able to hire folks? Um, I think those are very, those are considerations people don't put into their technology choices. And I think it, those, those are sort of as important as, you know, uh, you know will it scale? All right, uh, well, let's call it an evening. Thank you very much.